just say hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Big Challenges in Data Modeling, Top Data Modeling Myths, sponsored today by CA Technologies and Sand Hill Makers. And this series is moderated by the esteemed Karen Lopez. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights, questions via using, via using hashtag BCDmodeling, Big Challenges in Data Modeling. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of this session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. And I am very pleased to introduce to you the moderator for this webinar series, Karen Lopez. Karen is a Senior Project Mar Manager and Architect at Info Advisors. She specializes in the practical application of data management principles. And Karen is a frequent speaker, blogger, in fact, she has a blog on dataversity, and panelist on professional data issues. She is Microsoft SQL Server MVP, specializing in data modeling and database design. She's an advisor to the DEMA International Board and a member of the advisory board of Zachman International. And Karen wants you to love your data. Joining Karen this month are three esteemed guest panelists. Please welcome Terry Moriarty. Terry has spent a third of her career as a developer, third as a data architect, and a third as a business rules architect. She has to successfully understand an organization's business information management requirements. Independence between these three aspects must be exposed, explored, articulated, and balanced. She accomplishes this through the use of metadata management methodologies and environments. And joining us this month is Dr. Daniel Moody. Dr. Daniel is the director of Osmetics, a Sydney-based information management consultancy firm. He holds a doctorate in information systems from the University of Melbourne and has held senior positions in some of Australia's leading corporations and consultancy firms. He has conducted consulting assignments in 12 different countries, covering a broad range of industries. He's a member of DEMA and received the 2013 DEMA International Achievement Award. Congratulations on that. And last but certainly not least, Please welcome Larry Burns. Larry has worked in IT for more than 25 years as a database administrator, application developer, consultant, and teacher. He holds a BS in mathematics from the University of Washington and a master's degree in software engineering from Seattle University. He currently works for a global Fortune 500 company as a data architect and teaches a series of data management classes for application developers. He's the author of the book, Building the Agile Database, Published by Technics in 2011 and writes a feature column for TDAM.com. Please welcome Karen and our panelists. And with that, I will turn it over to Karen to get us started. Hello and welcome. Hi, thanks, Shannon. That's great. Um, thank you, Shannon. And I should also mention Tony of Dataversity for making these webinars happen and, and for uh, doing them in a very open manner where we have the chat where it, audience members can chat with each other, make commentary. We can all see that, by the way. Um, as well as the formal Q&A, as Shannon mentioned, make sure that if you have a question or a burning comment, put it in the Q&A. We do try to monitor the chat, but there's a lot going on there. And don't wait till the end to put your question in. Ask them at any time. Um, today's topic is one of my favorite ones, which is myths in data modeling. It's very much related to one of my oldest and most popular presentations, which is data modeling and contentious issues. And that Invitation. I talk about sort of the same thing that applies here. Is why would we be talking about these things if they're asked? Well, in the 30 plus years that we've had data modeling and data architecture around, probably even more than that, um, we still have a lot of urban legends and myths being passed around, especially uh, in the data architecture community and the data modeling community, but also with developers, DBAs, um, technologists, project managers think that we should be continuing to discuss. I've tried to pick some questions and topics here that aren't all totally logical or totally false, totally true. And the way that we, uh, the way that I picked them is I wanted to make sure we have a good discussion there. Um, the one of the things I'd like for our panelists to do is to tell me at the end whether or not they think it's totally or not. Now, for this presentation, there's not there are slides. I do have one slide for categorizing things because modeling is just categorizing things. Audio and panelists for this. So, 
having said that, I'm just going to turn off my webcam so that you don't have to watch me multitask. Don't forget to tweet. Uh, again, the hashtag is BC Data Modeling. But I'm going to uh, – oh, and I want to thank our sponsors as well for making this happen. Uh, and you can see the sponsor there with CA and Santa. The things that I picked to do about the myths today are uh, enterprise data modeling, as in data modeling, nitty-gritty details of data modeling, and some about presentation and format, and then some other things. Let's start with the ultimate myth of enterprise data modeling, which is, is data modeling is dead or dying. This is probably one of the most contentious ones. And so I'd like to start with um, asking you, Daniel, is enterprise data modeling is dead or dying? Go. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> that, that was that was that was not in the script, uh, Karen. <laughs> oh, you mean I might have. <laughs> I think oh. that uh, enterprise, well, enterprise modeling, I think, is even more important today than it's ever been. With you know more global organisations, more of these issues of of uh, acquisition and and mergers, and this has become a way that, that much more common way that that companies grow. That enterprise data modeling has given itself a bad name in that people tend to not know where to stop. I think the value is in enterprise data modeling is this 80 20 or even 90 10, where you don't try to go into too much detail. But I think it's very difficult for people who have been trained as data modelers and you know come up with normalization and getting defined data to the, to the utmost detail. If you try to apply that, at the end, you never finish. Analysis paralysis, you uh, waste a lot of money and the project gets canned. So I think the need still is there, but I think it's quite a difficult thing to do. And so it's a contradictory skill for the, for the uh, you know, kind of uh, traditionally trained data modeler. Okay, so good points there. Terry, what do you think about this? I'm currently at a rather large government agency, and they have enterprise organization. They do have um, an enterprise data model. Um, they have to do a lot of data sharing across their organizations, and I'd say that's probably a reason for why they are doing it. Um, Success be on a very little part of that big huge organization. They like forgot about us completely and didn't bother to include most of our information and we're trying to get that in there now. But they at least understand that there are large enterprise that shares data. The fact that they're governmental affects the answer to this question since they're technically not-for-profit, or do you think it's because they're large and complex? I like to think it's because large and complex. <laughs> Good answer. So, Larry, you work for an enterprise company. Is enterprise data modeling dead dying? I don't think so at all. Uh, I, certainly, I think we've gotten past the idea of eating the entire elephant at a single meal. Certainly, everything that we do has to be informed by some sort of overarching architecture and design. Otherwise, we're just, you know, it's off randomly in all directions. But I think that what we do at the enterprise level needs to be done in an iterative fashion, an incremental fashion. And we do it as part of large scale projects and initiatives. So right now we're doing EPA greenhouse gas compliance work, and that touches most of our systems and most of our, our business processes. And so we're working our enterprise level data and process modeling into that initiative. And then later on, as we're doing uh, replacement of legacy applications, we'll be doing more of it. We're still doing enterprise level data and process modeling, mm -hmm. but we're doing it incrementally as part of ongoing projects. 
Oh, I don't have like a three-year project to go out and mow every single thing in the company and then do IT work? Oh, no, and it wouldn't be <laughs> really practical to do that as rapidly as things change in our industry. Exactly. So it sounds like all of the panelists have said that uh, no, enterprise data modeling is not dead, but why do we hear that so much? I hear it a lot. I hear that data modeling in general is dead, but definitely that enterprise data modeling is dead. So I'll open this up to anyone who wants to speak first. Hmm. I, I'll the punt and, and say that I think a lot of people don't understand or misunderstand what data modeling is, and they don't understand the value that it can contribute. In particular, I, I don't think people understand its value in uh, bringing together a lot of different stakeholders and during collaboration among stakeholders, uh, drawing people towards agreements on important business requirements. People think of data modeling as something that's only relevant to data people that the data gnomes mm -hmm. do in their little cubicle or their <laughs> office. And we need to bring data modeling out into the open, bring to the table with all the stakeholders in a project present, the business analysts, the business users, the project managers, the developers, and use data models as a tool to drive consensus and agreement on critical business requirements. Then people will see the value that data models bring to any sort of initiative or, or whatever. Gosh, that sounds like that just takes a whole lot of time, and we don't have time for that. Go on to the next myth is that data mining just makes projects take longer. Myth. With Terry. Okay, I was going to jump in. I think it is. I um, don't think that the data modeling is takes too long. The analysis and understanding your data takes. Ah. Ah, so so boxes and lines, not the problem, usually. So that's – and it, that, to me, is actually helpful for people who are visual because trying to understand those relationships through an L spreadsheet is almost impossible. And mm -hmm. for the ability to see something graphically, it's just that the graphics have to be put together um, in the right manner, organized correctly, and to the same audience, or to the appropriate audience, a problem when we use the term data modeling in what type of data model. I hear data mm -hmm. model, and they're talking about a physical database design. I hear data model, and they're talking about your relational, normalized, you know, only third normal form model, name for QWERTY, all of that type of stuff. And then there is data modeling from the business perspective to understand the business requirements, which apparently uses a different vocabulary and could care less about normalization. So what data model do you mean? So you actually touched upon one of my other myth questions is, you know, how many types of data models are there? And I don't not really referring to conceptual logical physical, although those are definitely types of data models. Um, I think a lot of stuff that I read um, when people say either they need a data model or they don't need a data model, is I always ask them, so what do you mean by a data model? So they, how many data models are there? Oh, how, how many data models are there? That's a good Type question. Data model. <laughs> um, well, I, yeah, I'm, I guess I don't really distinguish between types of data models except in terms of their, their scope. I think that enterprise data models and application data models are completely different animals. I think that it requires people with quite different skills to a little bit like, I suppose, the difference between an architect, so someone who is going to design a house for you, and a, and a town planner. And a town planner and an architect, 
they have different they come from different disciplines often different faculties in a university and require quite different skills one is very detail focused on construction one is looking at the big picture and how all things fit together that's the only distinction i have ever made is that between mm-hmm. application models and and enterprise models and one is like, like right down into the detail on data types and lengths and this kind of stuff and the other one is much higher at a business level and focusing on what are the needs that the information requirements to support business strategy the fact, that this, yeah, the fact that i keep running into this myth all the time or this misunderstanding it really is it's something we as data modelers have dropped the ball on in not helping get that sort of thinking out into the world? Well, that, well, I suppose the data models, because our discipline is about classifying things and, and so on, I think that encourages people, and you will see even in data models that people will classify the different types of, of entities. So sometimes this actually makes it much more complex when you're trying to explain models to people. But I would be interested whether in other panelists think that there are different species or subspecies of, of data models. I try to keep it simple. Well, certainly I a distinction between what I call logical models, which concern themselves with describing the business data domain and demanding business data definitions, constraints, requirements, business rules, and then physical models, which are the mapping of business data requirements to some appropriate choice of architecture and technology. So they, the physical models concern themselves with the physical implementation of data requirements. I, I, I would not call the models, because I think that is something that I'm confusing. If you call it a database design, whereas model is something that you do use to uh, communicate with the business. Yeah, and I guess what I would say is that logical models are what I use to communicate with business users. Physical mm-hmm. models or physical designs are what I use to communicate with application developers and other implementers. I guess, sorry, I wouldn't, yeah, I guess I, I would just model not call them. Model. Mm. is meaningless. You mm. have to put the model in front to say which type of model you're using, and you have to define what you mean, because a logic model in my world, having come out of the IDEF world, is completely normalized, very generalized, as whose name for clarity has added all of your um, class words and requirements. Um, that keys be inserted and propagated. It's not the type of business model I use. Okay. Yeah, here's the deal. So you're talking about us, right? Not just developers, but data modelers and data architects ourselves. So it sounds like to me we have dropped the ball. I mean, well, and we preach that we are going to model, uh, you know, heaven forbid, a single version of the truth, and that we need a, a corporate glossary, and we need standardized terminology, and when we talk about the business, we need to make sure that we're all in agreement what a customer is. And yet the very core thing that we use as our main tool for what we do, for documenting it, for revealing it, for analyzing it, thing that we don't have single terms for and common definitions or a single glossary, and we're, we could all debate for hours about what makes for a good data model and what is. Do you agree? I that the data modeling community is its own worst enemy. And that really <laughs> became apparent when I sort of left the data community and went into the business world um, and who is absolutely dependent on having properly defined terms and, and understanding what their data is. And yet the data that we were producing didn't work. Yeah. Good and contentious. Love that. The way I looked at it is that we're... Sorry. I was just was following up on Terry's comment. And why didn't the data models work? Or how do you define how they worked? That people couldn't understand them or they couldn't implement them? Uh, 
<laughs> almost both. Um, we have the problem that, and I'm not going to say that a, a normalized data model cannot be implemented, but I find that most um, data architects don't implement that. Why? But they just want to and duplicate data for e access and ease of programming is much more important than, in my opinion, any of the data, data DBAs I've encountered is more important than um, um, data. Um, and they have a different goal, and that's why they don't like the, the logical, normalized data model. This model we just put the words and change the meaning of the business in a logical, what I consider to be a logical noise data model to be useless to them. Yeah. If they can't do it. That's, that's a nice uh, point because, well, I, I, I guess there's two points there. One is about the physical, the, the database designers, and I think there's a little bit of psychology here because uh, a lot of the database designers I'm a little bit old school, and you know, grew up in the days where you really had kind of slow uh, disk drives and everything. You had to optimize these things, and they will often optimize models that don't need to be optimized. But it's their craft, and you want to apply your craft, and you want to get this database fast. So you want to apply these uh, denormalized techniques where necessary or not. I think the other point about changing, and I've seen some absolutely bizarre cases of this um, where, for example, I worked in a bank and changed, you know, and you know, everyone in the bank from tellers up to you know, the CEO think in terms of banking products and accounts. And you come together and, you know, none of these terms were not precise enough because they could be used with general ledger accounts. And their, their word, the standard word in the core data model for an account was offered product agreement. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That was, <laughs> and, and, and you know, when you had to explain this to anyone, you say, well, that's, to, that's an account. And they'd all say, well, when you call it an account, then we would understand it. <laughs> <laughs> so this Let is me all make good a segue. Quick... 30 seconds. Okay, quick point. Uh, what, we're, what we mostly want to try to do with our models is to have conversations with stakeholders on a project, trying to drive some sort of consensus on requirements and needs. And, and so our piece of modeling or modeling paradigms really comes down to what kind of problem are we trying to solve at the moment and what group of stakeholders are we trying to communicate with and, and collaborate with and get to some sort of consensus on. So that would be a good contentious conversation as well. <laughs> so, uh, because I just want to uh, rule a little bias here. So for the last couple of years, I've been primarily acting in a role as one of these um, physical implementer data models, so half database design, uh, still logical model, and uh, mostly the reason I've been doing that is I've been working on troubled projects quite a bit, which means someone has built something with a data architect and can't get it to work. So I'm coming in definitely at a late stage development type project, which forces me to work on sort of at lower rows of the Zachman framework where I'm still trying to build logical models, but very much project or application models and not really as much enterprise models. And as you can all guess, most of these projects exist in the environment with no enterprise model and very few data architects. That's why they got into this position. So of all the statements that are being made, um, but I'm going to jump into sort of our next category of nitty-gritty data modeling. And oh, my sorry, first one Karen. Here, yes. Sorry, Karen. Can I just yeah. inject there slightly? Because sure. I probably should um, mention that you know we were talking about all the different types of models, and Terry was saying there's a lot of confusion about what a model actually is. And yeah. Dama has produced this Dama yeah. dictionary of data management, and they do find yeah. what data model is, 
what enterprise data model is and yeah. logical data model. And I guess if people started to adopt this terminology that has the the fine meaning that and yep. across the industry, that this might clear up a lot of the confusion. Exactly, good point. So data, as we say it in some parts of the world, so dama.org has both a dictionary of data management terms as well as a guide to the data management body of knowledge. Um, so the DMBOC, DMBOC uh, those are two great resources where the profession is trying to come together to standardize some of these things, and it's more of can we get that knowledge out there and get that adopted. So great point. So I want to move on to the nitty-gritty details of data modeling. So um, one of the ones I have, which we could have touched on, is that there's a kind of an understanding that Good data modelers never think of performance or implementation issues. And I'm going to let the panelists just tell in their answers what sort of data modeler they're talking about. But let's start with uh, Terry again. Terry, what do you think? Data modelers, because you kind of mentioned that in one of your other answers. We shouldn't be constrained to thinking about performance. I personally think that a good data modeler Understand that there are performance and um, you know two considerations, and um, there's different ways when you're designing your database, your data model. And I do consider data modeling to be design. You can mm -hmm. take that into consideration, but it's the kiss of death when you're trying to understand a business area. You mm -hmm. care about anything except that what the business is trying to say. You don't want to be worrying about keys. You don't want to worry about whether it's a multi-attribute or not. You don't. You, you just want to understand what the business is. And if you let those considerations creep in to compromise and bias your design, that's like, in my opinion, really bad. Anybody else? Yeah, in my view, logical, what I call the logical model, is business-focused and is implementation-independent and application-neutral. From the from business perspective, there isn't any prescription about how or even whether any of the data requirements are going to get physically implemented in some particular way. It's one of the, the myths that I, I'm always is this idea that when you do a data model, you're automatically assuming that it's going to be implemented as a third normal form relational database. It could be implemented as XML or an object database or a NoSQL database mm -hmm. or whatever. So it's, it's when you start moving into some conversations and agreements around the physical implementation of data, that start having to worry about performance and keys and indexes and so on. And that, to me, is when you start moving from the logical model, which to me is a business requirements model, to a physical design. Actually, you mentioned a good word for my next question, so I'm going to make this a rapid-fire yes-no answer. Uh, do keys belong in a logical model, and what about some specifically like the use of surrogate key, so a meaningless key. So, Larry, yes or no? <laughs> I can't answer that yes or no. Ph philosophically, I would say... Wait, 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 wait. Uh, surrogate wait don't go on. Wait, no. Well, I'm so sorry, answer but is... I, I, no, my no, answer no, is... I yeah, all right. What's your answer? Yes or no answer? Uh, I can't give a yes or no answer to that question. Okay, Terry? Okay. Please, no, say yes or no to other aspects. Logical model. Okay, and Daniel? Well, again, it depends on, yes on where no. you are. <laughs> oh. <laughs> In logical model, uh, no. No keys. Hmm. Not so, necessary, but only, uh, only the keys that, that the business will recognize. <laughs> Sorry. 
Yeah. I do want I, attributes that are identifiers that can use okay, identifiers. Sorry. Yeah. Attributes that are unique. This is important okay. business information that needs to be included in the logical data model. But I do not have to pick which one the deviates are going to use for their key. Excellent. So key keys. You yeah. identify, right? That's what you're saying. So to yeah. use the proper term. Um, but um, so now the reason I was trying to do it for a rapid answer is I want to come to the other thing is, do your modeling tools, though, kind of force you to choose something, a single candidate key, the um, identifier or primary key of an entity? Right. That's the point I was trying to get to. Excellent. So philosophical. We agree that surrogate keys don't belong in the logical model. The modeling tool I use pretty much forces me there's going to be a surrogate key in the physical design. I have to put the surrogate key in the logical model, but then what I do is I create an alternate key representation in the logical model showing the natural business key of an entity. And then that gets usually implemented in the physical design as a unique index or a unique constraint. Mm -hmm. That's that's the word I was searching for, Larry. A natural business key. A natural mm -hmm. business key is uh, what I think belongs in the logical model. And one of the nice things actually about the object-oriented model is every object or every class has a surrogate key you know, uh, by default. And you don't have to think about it. It's just already there. You can add additional keys or natural business keys, but they're, you know, at at the logical level, you just assume everything can be uniquely identified. Right. You do have to struggle with the limitations of our tools. There's no getting around that. My tool does trigger the, um, that you find the key. I call model and they put it in the key. And flexible enough that it didn't support object role modeling on its own, but I could create my own diagramming style, and I actually use a simplified version of object role modeling for my business model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It brings to the point that um, we've said we needed to define data modeling, but one of the things is the notation of our models, for instance, F1X the presentation layer of it, and even some of the underlying features much assumes or ha delivers the most sort of presentation value when there are identifiers and, uh, I'm not going to say keys, because that's what they're called in IDEF1X, I mean, and identifying attributes that migrate down a relationship into a child entity. And it's very much, um, very much, uh, the same sort of presentation layer we'd like to see in a database diagram with primary keys and foreign keys. Would you agree with that? But notations don't assume that. Like even the the, the real IE notation, information engineering notation, you know, you could have relationships of identifiers, not their underlying owned attributes, right? Yes, the methodology can be a hindrance or it can be a an enabler. So one in one of my other presentations, the other point I make is as much as I want to have different identifiers in my logical model than I have as primary keys in my physical modeling tools, that's very painful to do. It requires a lot of extra work. Would you agree? Not Definitely. Tools, not. not in my tools. What tool do you use, Harry? I use a architect. Architect, mm. is that what you said? Yeah. Um, so I think, and one of the reasons I mentioned IDEF1X is some modeling tools, that is their underlying notation. And it's a government standard, and they can't really uh, deviate from that. Um, the model uses that notation, right? That that really impacts that. So the government standard that's driving that, or a, I'll just say a third-party standard. It's a third-party standard that the, that the U.S. government at least has adopted. And um, the other thing is tools. So the point I want to make is tools influence our answers about whether something is a myth or not much more than we realize. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, a tool is on to a different one. And I have 
have an interface to the to that requires um, that is required by the government that I put the keys in. I can export it to that tool, and that's what I deliver to the um, enterprise people. The tool is the model, my conceptual model in the to want. So another yes, because we're just going to keep rapid fire through these. Um, and I Larry used the term um, third normal form data model. So myth is if you're in fourth normal form, fifth normal form, voice cod normal form, made up normal form, um, have over modeled it just by definition, like it's third normal form is the holy grail of a good data model, right? <laughs> me, it, it all comes down to what problem are you trying to solve and what sort of an agreement are you trying to reach with what, what group stakeholders. Absolutely. You model, you model to whatever extent you need to model in order for everybody at the table to understand what the problem is and how the problem needs to be solved. Okay. Good try. Um, so if we treat that, 140 characters. So the bring this up, though, is that I think it's there's a lot of mythology about normalization and normal forms. In fact, I have a series on dataversity.net that I need to add another myth to um, on normalization myths. And, and one of them is that, that normalization levels is like a grade. What a great data modeler you are because everything's in tenth normal form, or what a practical data modeler you are because you never go beyond third normal form. Um, I think that's the intent of normalization. Um, and as a matter of fact, you could have an entity or table that has, you know, single value key and just a couple columns, and by definition, that would be in, you know, normalization form possible just because not denormalized and it meets all the tests of you know identity for that entity. Is that Daniel? Well I think that you know normalization is fundamental to data modeling. It's what adds rigor to it. So you know if you compare process models when you can just pretty much draw anything on a on a wall and that's one person's opinion and it's another that the normalization does provide where it does provide standards that you can provide apply to any data. But I think importantly, it raises the business questions which you can talk to the, the business stakeholders about. So they don't need to understand normalization, but by going through these normalization tests, you ask the questions that they asked to get the model right. And I think that's a I think that's a good point, uh, Daniel. In that normalization, especially in logical modeling, is done for the purpose of understanding the business problem, the business requirements, the business data domain. So you normalize to whatever extent is needed to understand the business problem you're trying to solve or the business area you're working in. In physical design. You normalize mostly for the purpose of creating reusable data structures, reusable data objects. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. and I, I think the thing about normalization is that it's exhaustive. You have to look at every single datum and ask the question: um, you know, are there multiple of these? What is the relationship, and so on. And that's what I think is, is so powerful about it. And you see a lot of people these days who have not been classically trained in, uh, in data modeling. They've just been given a data modeling tool. They start putting attributes in and think that's all to it. But it, it's so fundamental to understand that. It's not something that you have to teach to business people. They don't need to know because they just get asked the questions that you can use to determine whether you're data is in third normal form. I think it's 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 mandatory. You cannot miss it out because your data model cannot possibly be found if you did go through those checks. Mm -hmm. I think like really go ahead, Terry. 
I think the aspect of training, because quite a few of us have done for many years, and I started out in, in in IT, you know, went to courses and seminars, and we were trained in how to do data link, how to do normalization. I find now that I business analysts who have who don't know how to develop a process model and have never been even gone to class in doing that, that business analysts are now being expected to create data model, whatever data model yeah. they're told to do, and yet they have no training. And I think it's a lot harder to gather the discipline, the discipline of being a data modeler than it is to be a process modeler. And yet they're expected mm-hmm. to do it and also expected mm-hmm. to do it at a really low rate. Um, <laughs> and because of that, that's supposed to be a jack-of-all-trades, they really are bringing down the quality um, a lot of what we would have considered a good data model. And when I develop my business model, and I put it in what I call business model form, through all the steps that you have to go to end with a normalized model, I know what the normalized model is going to look like. But because you have to understand if it's a multi-valued attribute. You have to understand what the identifiers and what potential identifiers are. You have to understand if you have a relationship between two concepts that are many-to-many, is there a hidden business concept behind there that no one has ever exposed? If there is, you're going to bring that into your business model. It's not there for the purpose of resolving the many-to-many relationship there because it's an important business concept because there's an awful lot that the business knows that they don't know. So I think normalization is essential, but I wouldn't grant anybody by it. Right. The other thing is is that I don't have a step on my project plan for I'll go normalize the model, right? And that's not quite often how modeling is taught is to teach people the sort of I don't, I don't produce a first normal form data model, then a second normal form data model, then a third normal form data model. I think even where it is training, it, it's not a realistic sort of like, it's normalization is a question I ask my entities. I think of interrogating them to see if they've right. got the right level of, and I don't even use the word normalization when I do the work. For right. me, it's just a decision. I call design decisions, but that's just because that's where I'm working. Because I still, I personally think of even a logical model as some sort of design. I've made decisions about the data and about its granularity and about what uniquely identifies one. So in my mind, that's either design or architecture. It's just a different type than database design or architecture. Well, I agree and with so, you. And I, the yeah. first time I read um, Grand Simpson's book, it was, he makes the point that if you just do analysis right, you're going to end up automatically in third normal form and possibly fourth without going through the steps. Yeah. I mean, you're asking the questions, but you're not producing a diagram. And I kind of just sat there as a former developer and said, that, yes, that's yeah. right. The else confusing me. I think so it's very important. And the first one that I read <laughs> The logical data model is design. You're making design choices. It's not pure representation of the business domain. This yeah. work I highly recommend. And that's data modeling essentials. Um, so, excellent. So, we've kind of segued into another thing, and I think, uh, Terry, you mentioned something about it, and this is one. Um, I want to caution you to you as you respond to me what type of data model that you're about. But the myth, uh, it's very contentious within sort of the data management community is that end users should not be shown a data model. Um, they need to be walked through it, and they should never be shown a physical model. So what, what do you think, Terry? Obviously, since I work primarily at the business level, of a business domain, um, I, I 
probably don't agree with that, but that will have to be organized properly. It has to be. I have had business people halfway through my modeling sessions stay up and say they're going to start doing the model and start put boxes and was on the screen and up on the, the board and they're able to figure it out how to do it themselves. The same way they do with process modeling. And I find it interesting that process models can go all the way around all four walls and nobody says that's too complicated for business people to understand. But heaven forbid we should put up a big data model and it's like, oh my God, it's just too big. There's too much stuff on it. I know one well, I would, because I would slightly disagree with that. Um, at least, yeah, we've got to start disagreeing with with another. What sort of webinar is this? <laughs> but I would say it applies to any model when it's too complex. And I see all the time that that people come in and produce these BPMN models that I don't they understand themselves, and they show them to business people, and their eyes goes over. And I think the single greatest barrier to communicating models to business people is excessive complexity. And and it's well known that experts, so if you're an expert data model, you're an expert uh, process model, you can deal with these incredibly complex diagrams. But business people can't. And you know, I go back to you know, Tom Ducco and his data flow diagrams and his seven plus or minus two bubbles per diagram. And the strange thing is, is most people think data flow diagrams are dead. In fact, they did a study of practice in Australia, and it was the second most commonly used modeling technique in practice. And there is, they produce nice simple diagrams that business people can understand, and that's why business yeah. analysts use them. And just a snarky comment there. I think the most common uh, in process on diagram is something called Visio with random notations, random objects, random rules, and no uh, sort of um, a very much ad hoc drawing. And the reason I say that is it all ties around to back to what Terry said, where there's little training in a lot of these things where People sometimes, and then my intake, my take is that people are sometimes so overly constrained by these notation rules, and sometimes they just want to have no outbound flows, and sometimes, and and it's because they're focused on just communicating some ideas, um, so they're really just formalizing an ad hoc whiteboard model, um, and you know, I think that part of this is, is that people have been trained, so they're uncomfortable with the rules, the constraints that the tools put in, are there for a good reason. But then just lean to a drawing tool and call that data modeling or process modeling. Yes, I, want to make, I think one Carl made the point on the um, chat session that you don't create a single huge data model diagram for presentation. That's Most people do. You break it down just like you said for the processes. You break it down by subject area, by topic. I call them views. Um, and you violate some rules in that I allow the same entity to be on multiple views so that if it's applicable to the topic. So my data model that we have, and it's a very small project, it has 300 um, tables in it, so that's pretty small, a lot of standards, and it's broken down into 24 topics. And people look at the topic diagrams, not the big piece of paper that it would, even with 300 um, entries on it, you wouldn't be able to lay it all out in a readable fashion. I make extensive use of subject areas in, in my data models. It's, it, it's a, yeah, that's an interesting uh, issue because my. Um, Doctoral research was actually on representation of of large data models, and and what I discovered, and it's actually some a big theory around this called cognitive fit theory, about adapting representations to audience. 
And one of the things that non-experts have, so business people, is that they have difficulty with very complex models, whether they're process models, whether they're data models, it simply doesn't matter. Yet experts, and this is what I found in my research, is that if you give a data model that has been modularized into subject areas to database designers, they have difficulty with it. All right? They're comfortable using you know, electrical engineers and huge circuit diagrams. So once, you, so, uh, and this is called the expert re reversal effect. So a representation that, that is useful for communicating with experts is not the same representation that, that is useful for communicating with non-experts or with business people. So mm -hmm. that you actually need <laughs> kind of both because uh, you know the the big complex one and also the modularized one. It'd be nice if if two could do this this automatically. Yeah, I mean I use tools for a long time that have the ability to take the diagram and the lines that have always been called business rules and translated the lines into English sentences. And yep. I had a business person come to me and said, I'm not a visual person I don't get that diagram at all but yeah this report that you gave me and I just because it was there he goes I can read this and I can tell you this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong so he was a textual oriented person as opposed mm -hmm. to a visual oriented person on the other hand I'll take this was a story very very large bank had what would be equivalent to I guess a conceptual data model that covered three whiteboards. We never allowed anybody to erase it. Um, it was before tools. And um, it basically laid out what it means to be a bank, about every aspect of what it means to be a bank on those three boards. And I had the um, SVP of the rebank bring the mining manager the, the, who didn't understand what it meant at the time to put up his products when deregulation was going on way back in the 80s. This is when this happened. And he would bring these people, these business people, over and have me go through my presentation of that model, which told them what it meant to be a bank in a non-regulated environment. It had nothing to do with data. It had nothing to do with going to become data in a database to them, it was the bank of the future and it was through a data model and they got it. So data people yeah. can understand things and that's like a really bad thing to do. Yeah. Coming down to the last seven minutes or so, I've been trying to answer some of the Q&As uh, in writing as people are talking. One of the things I wanted to note as we go through those is that there seem to be a lot of requests for getting into the whole data modeling and agile thing, which is a huge interest to me. I know to some of our analysts as well, um, all of my projects are agile scrum or some sort of newer development technology. And my answer to that is I think that's a whole webinar. I think have done one in the past, maybe even prior to me hosting these. Um, but maybe it's time to do another one of those again because there are still lots of questions and myths around those as well, and we definitely won't be able to talk about those in the last two minutes that we basically have. Um, but there's also uh, a lot of conferences where we talk about those things, including Enterprise Data World. Uh, there's usually something. There's also workshops. I know I did do a workshop based on that. I know some other um, regular speakers do about that too, so I just wanted to put a plug in for those. Uh, there's also been some questions about tools that we use and everything, and my answer for that is sort of it depends. Uh, I have a blog post about what's the best data modeling tool, and basically the answer for it, it depends on what you need, just like the other tool. Um, I wanted to bring up the point that um, one of these one myths that we talked about today. Panelists, do you agree that we could have spent the whole hour just talking about that one myth? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is intentionally sort of trying to, to talk about myths in general. Um, but I wanted to ask each of my panelists, 
did you sort of a theme takeaway or really important point that you wanted um, in a sentence or two uh, for our audience? So I'll start with Daniel. A sentence or two. I think the, the, the secret to resolving these myths is actually to look at the evidence for and against. And sometimes it just comes down to consensus of opinion, and I guess that's a little bit what we're doing here. My focus over the in recent years has been on diagramming and a huge amount of evidence out there because people have been seeing, or psychologists have been studying how the human tool system works for hundreds of years but it would be with some of other myths we could actually resolve them by by real evidence about what actually works and evidence based data modeling <laughs> Brian, so good I'm going to say that my takeaway we didn't entirely get into you know, I alluded to it that data modeling is not an isolated activity isolated process, that if you're trying to understand a business domain, we're doing the process analysis and the business rule analysis and balancing the three aspects, make sure the business rules use the data terms, that the business rule processes know which business rules they're implementing and what data it needs, um, you're not going to understand that business need to, that you need to understand all the things that we go through and you have to understand and they have to be balanced. Those were really long sentences, but good job. And Larry? <laughs> I think of data modeling in terms of model-driven development, and I talk a lot about this in my book. In model-driven development, you're trying to do three things. You're trying to achieve collaboration and consensus among stakeholders. You're trying to reach a common understanding of what the business problem is and what needs to be done to solve it. And you're also trying to create a solution to that problem in the quickest amount of time. And our modeling tools allow us to do all three things. If, if we use them correctly, we can bring everybody to the table, talk about what the problem is, what needs to be done to solve it, and then we can actually generate a part of the solution to that problem from our modeling tool. So T, data modeling is very much a part of model-driven application development. Excellent. Okay, everybody, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we come down to the last couple of minutes, and I I want to thank the panelists for sharing final shots. There were such great things in the chat and so many questions. So what we usually do is the formal part of the uh, session will end in a couple of minutes. Um, we'll, as many as possible of us will stay on to try to get through those questions and answer them, um, both in the chat and verbally. So I welcome you to stay on. Uh, what I think we learned from all this is that we as a data management profession need to get our act together and try to establish more um, sort of common uh, terminology and vocabulary around these things in a way that contributes back to make less pain for end users, developers, BBAs, and us and the business, and that we need to keep talking about these myths. We should be blogging and writing and speaking about these things, but as a whole, our community doesn't do that, and we should be doing that, not just in webinars. Um, so that's my rant on that. Um, I'd also welcome any comments in the chat about how ideas for how our community solves some of these problems of the myths. Uh, that's something that's really important to me and something I work on quite a bit. I want to thank again our sponsors, uh, CA Technologies, the makers of Irwin, your common popular tool, uh, and uh, Shannon, our editor at Dataversity and our webinar expert, and Tony Shaw at Dataversity. And all of our panelists, you guys did a great job. I sent you all kinds of rules and guidance, and pretty much you ignored them and still managed to pull off a wonderful webinar. And I wanted to thank our audience for these great questions. I hope you stick around. Our next session will our next monthly session on webinar will be on NoSQL data modeling. And so we'll be talking about where things fit in. It's on August 22nd. 
Um, it's going to take place during the NoSQL Now conference, which I'll be attending, and I'll be on a panel there talking about data modeling and NoSQL and all kinds of stuff. So check out NoSQL Now, which is you can get information on the Dataversity .net website as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Shannon to do the wrap-up part. She'll take herself off mute. That helps, certainly. <laughs> Karen, thank you so much, and thank you to our panelists, especially Dan. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much for, again, getting up at this odd hour in the middle of the night for you. And uh, thanks so much to our attendees. I just love how engaged you are, and just chatty, and and um, again, just engaged in the whole conversation. Uh, so, Karen, I will turn off the recorder for you.